Hello guys, I'm Dr. Sajad Pathan and I take this opportunity to wish you a very happy new year. Today we are going to look at few questions related to the MRKM primary. Without wasting further time, let's look at question number one. The structure injured during the procedure passes through which anatomical space? 63 year old female is <clears throat> in the ED with asymmetric head position and unable to move the neck to one side. She has had a right radical neck dissection surgery for her breast cancer three days ago. She developed the symptoms since yesterday and now complains of pain in the right neck and unable to move her head to the right side. When you are asked to push against the wall, you notice winging of the right scapula. <clears throat> so if you notice, this is a two-step question. First, we need to know what structure is injured and that structure passes through which anatomical space. In the exam, you may not see a two-step question but I've tried to make these questions a bit trickier so that you get two for one. First of all radical neck dissection causing damage to what structure and when do you see winging of scapula and other stuff and uh, anatomically which these structures pass through which space. <coughs> so let us look at the option cervical axillary canal, foramen ovale, foramen rotundum, hypoglossal foramen and jugular foramen. What I want you to do is take a 10 second pause and select your choice and then we'll look at the explanation given. I hope you have made your decision. Let's look at the explanation now. So the nerve to serratus anterior, which is the first option, cervical axillary canal. The nerve to serratus anterior, which is also known as long thoracic nerve, formed by roots of C5, C6 and C7, can give rise to winging of the scapula and that structure passes through cervical axillary canal. However, this patient had winging of scapula plus unable to move the neck on one side. So likely the nerve over there is the spinal accessory nerve. The, through the foramen ovale, you get the mandibular nerve. Through foramen rotundum, you get maxillary nerve. Hypoglossal foramen gives way for the hypoglossal nerve, which supplies the motor of the tongue. So the answer here is the jugular foramen, which through which three structure passes, 9th, 10th and 11th nerve. Axillary nerve can be injured during a radical neck dissection surgery which will give rise to paralysis of two muscles. One is the trapezius, second is sternocleidomastoid. A paralysis of trapezius can give rise to winging of scapula and sternocleidomastoid injury can give rise to torticollis or wry neck. So all those who have got the answer right, kudos to you. Let's look at question number two. Which of the following intracellular iron concentration is increased as a direct result of the drug that was most likely prescribed two weeks ago? 72-year-old man comes to the emergency department because of recent onset nausea, vomiting and changes in his vision. He describes the visual changes as yellow halos around light. Two weeks prior, he was seen because of leg swelling and trouble breathing when lying flat and was prescribed a new medication at that time. Drug toxicity related to the new medication is suspected. So the options here are calcium, chloride, magnesium, potassium, sodium. Let's take a 10 second pause and then see what is the right choice. So from the scenario here, we all know that this patient has come with GI plus vision changes and described as yellow halos around light. He was admitted likely for a congestive heart failure and was likely given digoxin. And digoxin can lead to toxicity if there is hypokalemia, that means low potassium levels in the blood can give rise to digoxin toxicity. And the low potassiums could be because of furosemide given at that time. Digoxin toxicity leads to hyperkalemia. But here the question is asking that which of the following intracellular iron concentration is increased as a direct result of the drug. So digoxin, if we look at the explanation, digoxin directly inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase pump. 
So when this pump is inhibited, sodium is not moving out of the cell, it remains in the cell and potassium stays out of the cell. This leads to an indirect sodium calcium exchanger activation so that the sodium can be pushed out and calcium can stay in. This calcium will go through the sarcoplasmic reticulum, bind with troponin C leading to cardiac contractility. So the direct effect of digoxin is sodium potassium ATPase pump and that will lead to sodium within the cell. So the right answer here is option E which is sodium. Let's move on to question number three. What should be an important information needed prior to administering the agent? 22 year old girl is in the ED with vomiting for last 12 hours. Her urine dip is positive for beta HCG and ketones. Her last menstrual period was eight weeks ago. Metoclopramide was given earlier with little effect. You are considering to use another anti-sickness that blocks 5-HT3 receptor. She is not allergic to any medications. So what information do we need? Do we need to get a blood gas to check for electrolytes? Do we need to get a bedside ultrasound to rule out ectopic? Do we need to get an ECG? Do we need to check for history of anaphylaxis to any agents? Do we need to get history of sudden cardiac death in the family? Again, we take a 10 second pause and then we move further. So if you look at the scenario, the, you want to prescribe a 5-HT3 receptor blocker, which is your ondansetrin. So what could be the side effects of ondansetrin that we have to be wary about before giving this medication? So let's look at the explanation. Ondansetrin is a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. It is third line in hyperemesis gravidarum as per the RCOG guidelines. The side effects are headache, constipation, and can give rise to QT prolongation. So you need to get an ECG to check for QTC prolongation. This is given as per the Royal College of OBGY guidelines. Remember, ondansetrin can also induce serotonin syndrome when used with SSRI, SSNRI, MAO inhibitor or TCA. So these are the important features we need to know about ondansetrin. If you got, so the right answer is get an ECG. History of anaphylaxis, to any, any agent is not the right answer because here it's clearly mentioned she is not allergic to any medication. History of sudden cardiac death in the family also does not play a role here. If you get an ECG and QTC is prolonged, then you can ask about history of sudden cardiac death. Uh, so all those who have got the answer correct, you well done, very well done. And uh, this would be the last question for today. And I shall see you soon with another video next month. But before I go, I want to put two questions for you guys to answer in the comment section. Name the analgesic that can precipitate serotonin syndrome with SSRI, SN, SSNRI MAO inhibitor and name the antibiotic that can precipitate serotonin syndrome. Put, put your answers in the comment below and I'll give you the correct answer in my next video next month. Thank you for watching. Please do like, share and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.